Welcome to our 2021 Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome as one of our first interviews of the new year, my Chief Executive Officer and President of Cleveland Clinic Florida Region, Dr. Connor Delaney. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to have you back. Uh, you stepped into the CEO job at, at quite a uh, an auspicious time in the history of, of medicine and surgery, um, certainly within our lifetimes. Uh, and certainly one of the greatest challenges you've had uh, above all of the challenges normally facing any CEO of a healthcare system, you, you walk into a rapidly expanding healthcare system in a financially challenging time in the midst of COVID. Uh, thankfully, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccines. So I'd like to focus with you on the role of the vaccines and the role out of the vaccines. And maybe you could start on a more global kind of view before we get down to our local level. Yeah, well, I think the global view is concerning. Obviously, we're in the early in the new year. Uh, we're in this third surge, and it seems to be significant and prolonged and probably going to be further exacerbated by two things. Uh, one is the Christmas and New Year holidays, which seem to be already driving up um, rates, incidents, hospitalizations. And the second is concerns about this new strain that's being described in Europe. Um, certainly in the UK, uh, certainly in Ireland, although the new, new strain hasn't been documented, certain hospitalizations are often, that's true in a number of other countries. So I think we're still under pressure and I think we're going to be under pressure for quite a while. And you're right, it drives our ability to provide care to other patients and it really compromises our ability to staff adequately. Um, if you look at us across the Cleveland Clinic with about 1200 caregivers out sick at the moment. If you look across the Florida region, it's about 160. And uh, that matters to us, not only the caregivers and the patients, but just the ability to provide care. So it's a real and ongoing issue, plenty to do. Yeah, in, indeed. Well, thankfully you've got the right person on, on the job, but to put it in context um, for the Cleveland Clinic, you and I work here, have worked for a long time, uh, but not everybody's familiar. So please put in context what 1200 means and what 150 means in terms of workforce size. Right, so just thinking of the US operations, it's. You know, we've got a dozen hospitals in Ohio and five in Florida, and it's about 66,000 caregivers, uh, some additional in Abu Dhabi, and we're growing London and Nevada and Toronto, but primarily US-based, so 60,000 plus. So, you know, it's, it's about one and a half percent of people out, and uh, often those are clinically facing, respiratory therapists, nurses, physicians, um, and so that uh, really impacts our ability to to staff adequately. And when you look nationally and regionally, and Florida is one of the states where it's the biggest challenge actually, and there's so many nurses out and so many nurses getting dragged to other states with the national surges um, on traveling contracts, and uh, that it becomes a, a regional staffing issue as well. But that's that gives you rough shape around our enterprise size uh, as part of the national staffing crisis. So thinking about that crisis and the magnitude, the number of people who are out at any given time, um, vaccines are, are now available. They, it's a bit like the COVID testing in the early days, March, April of, of last year when they were available, but perhaps not as available as we ideally would have wanted. And perhaps we're at that point with vaccines where at least what one reads in the news, we don't have as many as we need. Um, we're trying to preserve our workforce so that we can care for patients. At the same time, we're trying to care for patients to prevent them getting uh, seriously ill from COVID-19. So what is the algorithm for decision-making in terms of being a recipient of the vaccine? Yeah, so first, Steve, I think your analogy is very good. A little bit like testing uh, nine months ago. Uh, we had it, we were starting to get it, but we just didn't have enough of it. And that's where we are with vaccines. So companies are ramping up uh, manufacturing of vaccines, but it's not just manufacturing, it's also the logistics of getting shots in arms, syringes, needles, staffing, uh, and then the, the documentation that goes along with that. 
So the stage we're at now in the US is that two of the vaccines are approved, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. One is a little more, more complicated to store, you need a minus 80 freezer, the other a little less complex, but both of them end up being reasonably complex to administer, although we know from the trials that they're effective. And we know from the early safety data and now from about 10 days of administering these vaccines that they appear to be really safe. So that's the good news. The challenge is just ramping up the volumes because as soon as it became public that the vaccine was out, of course, everybody wants a vaccine. So if you look at the state of Florida, for example, about 22 million people, but close to 5 million of those are over age 65. And so the governor appropriately came out with an executive order and um, prioritizing patients over 65, which is very reasonable from the evidence. And frontline caregivers, uh, again, emphasizing the frontline caregivers, um, but who are patient facing, uh, clinically uh, working caregivers. And then balancing that against the importance of trying to use all the doses. So we also want to make sure we use all the doses available. So all of those are being very um, rapidly worked into algorithms of how we allocate. So we're allocating to patients uh, who fulfill the executive order uh, based on age and comorbidities. Uh, I was just on a call with many of the CEOs across the state, as well as the secretary of um, the healthcare agency or department of health for the state of Florida and the secretary general. And it's really interesting to see the similarities across all the hospitals. We're all setting up these systems for scheduling these mechanics of staffing up uh, sites so that we can give the vaccines, scaling up the call centers and lines because everybody's phoning and uh, looking for online systems uh, and yet dependent on the vaccine actually getting to us. And so the state is very carefully trying to make sure that when the vaccine goes to a hospital or a department or a county that it gets used. So I think right at the moment, going back to your analogy of, of testing, um, you know, we're at this stage where there's a lot of balls in the air as people figure out the fairly complex logistics of doing this. But it should be very different even within two weeks from now, I suspect. A lot of the processes will be stabilized and we'll have a little bit of a better understanding of the supply chain of the vaccines coming in and hopefully be able to communicate that better to patients so they can be less distressed about the ability to get a vaccine. What are the triggers going to be for starting to relax some of the other policies implemented uh, during the pandemic, such as limitation of visitors, temperature checks and the like? Um, I think that will be slightly hospital system related. It'll be slightly state related and stage of pandemic. And um, so, you know, everywhere is at a slightly different stage. When you look at the evidence, and when we look at what we put into practice, they may also not match up directly to. And I say that meaning that if you look at temperature, for example, a lot of places still doing temperature checks. There's probably very little evidence checking for temperature changes very much. But with everything going on, as you can understand, it's just not a time to withdraw on any one of these checks that we have for safety at the moment. So I, my guess is that, you know, six months from now, we probably won't be doing temperature checks fairly widely. I think people will still be masking. And um, we may be able to wind back on visitor restrictions, but it'll probably depend on hospital census and the fact that the surge that we're in now really does wind down. Um, but those will be staged uh, and they're the things that will change in time. What's going to be really interesting is how effectively we get the vaccine out to to patients and to communities, as well as to caregivers within the hospitals. Um, at the moment, we, as I think most other systems in the US are, and communities in the US are making it optional, right? So probably 50 to 60% of people want the vaccine. Surprising that it's not a little higher, but if you look at some other uh, countries, I just heard on the call earlier today that apparently in Israel, it's being made mandatory. And if you don't get the vaccine, you can't use public transport, for example. So we're obviously not there in the US. And we'll have to see how it changes over time. It may ultimately become somewhat of a passport to activity. Um, but not in the short term. In the short term, I think we need to just get out the information that it's safe and get out the structure with which we can make it available to people. And I suspect as people see it being used safely, 
and seeing the hospitalization and incidence rates drop, others will be happier to get it, uh, certainly in our society. Yeah, and it does raise an interesting dilemma. Israel may make it mandatory. I've heard of other countries in that part of the world where it will be mandatory as well. Um, and in some countries, I suppose that can be done. Clearly, we're not one of them. We're not going to mandate it. Um, and I don't even know that healthcare systems can, can, can mandate it. But would it influence work distribution. So let's say you've got a team of people and, and some of them have been vaccinated and uh, gotten both vaccines, they're more than a month out and other people have declined the vaccine. And in terms of assignment of personnel to care for patients, um, do you think there'll be any impact? Um, so I think it'll be something that's considered, but I think it's going to have to be something that's decided in a very considered manner. You know, and, and that will take even going down to the ethics of fairness and equity and responsibility. And so, you know, I, I, it's not something I think there is a correct answer for. Right. You know, at the moment, I think we're, we're in a, the start of a good place and, and that we have vaccines and that we're rolling them out. Um, and we just have to give patients and our community and our colleagues even the confidence that they're safe and that they're effective and that the the pharmacology and, and biology of the vaccine makes sense. Uh, and hopefully with a little time, it'll be increasingly used across society. Uh, on the theme of, of enough people getting vaccines to open up society, again, there are some considerations. And I've heard that video-based education is one of the silver linings out of an otherwise uh, very black cloud so that you and I are speaking today rather than in person in your office or my office or by video. Um, that same construct is obviously used for business meetings as well as academic meetings. You're vice president of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons. There's generally an annual meeting. At what point do you think we're going to revert, if we're going to revert to in-person meetings, or, or will it remain hybrid for some period of time, as best as you can tell? Well, so I, I think meetings in a, there's a few different layers of meetings in a way. First is what we're doing, conversations like this or conversations with patients virtually. I think they're here to stay. I think the efficiency uh, that this provides is um, very effective. Next is small meetings of small groups. You know, we'll, we'll have them with appropriate social distancing and masking. Um, I think they'll come back to a certain extent, um, probably towards the later part of this year. Um, and I think they're very important because humans are built to interact. And I think sometimes the, the soft skills and the offhand conversations or post-meeting conversations that happen are often very effective, efficient, and allow us to get a lot done. I think the larger meetings and society meetings and things like that, um, in my estimation, will take a little while. Uh, even in the later part of this year, I'm not sure we have the confidence or the ability to travel or enough hotels available or the ability to have time to plan ahead because for societies, whether it's the American Society of Colorectal Surgery or the college or anything else, you need to be planning now or have planned before now for meetings that will be happening in summer or fall. And so I, I think those are probably going to be next year. And I think there's always going to be an increased element of virtual meeting in parallel with those and a reduced element of in-person meeting. Again, coming back to the efficiency of cost, travel, time. Um, what do you think? Where do you think it's going to end up? I, I agree with you. I think um, many people were reluctant to have meetings like this. People weren't comfortable with the technology. And I think people by, by no option become very comfortable with it. It's, it's just been put upon us. And now people are realizing, yeah, I didn't necessarily need to fly to XYZ City for a two-hour lunch meeting and spend an entire day or even things like Grand Rounds. Yes, it's nice to meet the residents and have a dinner, but when you're going to a place where you have to leave the day before, fly there, get there, have dinner, give your Grand round, spend the next day flying home. So I was supposed to two hours out of work you spend one or two hours on video. And I think some of, not only that, but from as you say, a cost consideration. So the hospital doesn't have to pay people to come in from around the world. It broadens the net. You can now have speakers from all over the world. You don't have to limit yourself to domestic US. 
Uh, and I think many of those elements will stay, but I, I also think you're right that for the larger meetings, it is important. We are social creatures and physical distancing um, has impaired social gathering, obviously, and, and we need to get back together and at some point we will. Problem is none of us know when that will be. Uh, and certainly the hybrid, I think will probably be a transition where people who are comfortable traveling will travel and people who are not comfortable won't travel. There'll be some provision for time being. At least that's what my crystal ball tells me as of yeah. today. I agree, somewhere in the middle. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate your time and your insights. Um, and look forward to uh, staying in good health and getting through the rest of this pandemic whenever the end might occur. There you go, Steve. Thanks again for the opportunity and, and thanks for doing these meetings. I think it's so important to get this information out. So well done and thank you. My pleasure.